All righty. Hello, everyone. I think we're going to get started. People are still filtering in. Thanks so much for coming to our session um, on uh, implementing meta science. Uh, I'm Nick DeVito. I'm a postdoc at the University of Oxford uh, and a meta scientist. I work mainly in the policy arena um, on things like transparency, clinical trial transparency. But uh, I'm going to be your moderator today. And um, just to give you a little introduction or your co-moderator, you'll meet Delwin, uh, my, my co-moderator, in just a moment. But um, just to give you a little background on this session and uh, so when Delwin and I and Maya were first, who's one of our panelists today, we're chatting about putting together a session uh, for the one of these virtual sessions. We were thinking about sort of what we could add and what our common experiences and what we would like to see. Um, and basically, we came to the conclusion that, you know, having been to a few of these meta science conferences before and been generally active in the space, that meta scientists are very good at sort of identifying and diagnosing and measuring the extent of a problem and then talking about solutions. But when it comes time to implement those solutions for a variety of reasons, um, that doesn't always happen. It doesn't always happen effectively or efficiently. So uh, we wanted to collect a bunch of folks uh, to sort of have a talk about this and chat about their experiences, people who have real experiences in implementing um, solutions to meta-scientific problems that we sort of all know exist in one way or another. Um, so we're going to cover um, responsible uh, research uh, assessment today. We're going to cover grants. We're going to cover um, the publication system. And we're going to cover uh, clinical trial reporting, but also broadly reporting, responsible reporting in the context of, of, of all of science. Um, those are our broad topic areas. We have some great panelists that Delwin's going to introduce in a moment. And um, and she'll walk you through some of the mechanics of how the session is uh, is going to go. Um, it'll be um, a panel discussion um, for the most part, but with some interactive bits that Delwin will get into in a moment. And thank you to everyone who filled out the free um, sort of symposium survey, and uh, we'll be sharing some information on that. Over to you, Delwin. Thanks a lot, Nick. And hi, everyone, also from me. So um, as Nick said, I'm, I'm co-moderating the session. Very happy to be here today. And so my role today will be to um, monitor the chat and also present some questions to the audience and then really try to do some live synthesizing of, of the whole discussion. And I want to do a quick shout out to Frederica Kors, who's also here and who's going to um, be my teammate of, of like really trying to do this together. So thanks a lot, Frederica, for supporting us today. And yeah, also, thank you. Um, as Nick mentioned, we sent this Google uh, form to solicit a bit of get some of your input before this webinar. And that was really helpful to get a sense of who's participating today and to collect some of your experiences that will also be integrating into the discussion. So we're also really keen to, of course, keep getting your input throughout this, this, this webinar. So what we'll be doing, so if you um, have any questions throughout the session, please post them in the chat. We'll be monitoring that closely and feeding that back into the discussion. And we'll also be doing a bit of live polling with Mentimeter. And so just going to share a screen here to show you some instructions on that. So... Uh, so Mentimeter is just a platform in which we can solicit some, do some live polling, essentially. And all it requires is for you to go to this website, www.menti.com, and then you'll be prompted to enter a code. And it's a one-time code uh, that's valid for the entire session. And so if you just use this code, you'll just, the questions will pop up, essentially, and then you can enter your responses, and then we'll have uh, the results uh, live to be presented in the symposium. So I think Frederica is also going to be posting a link to this uh, with the code. Um, so yeah, so hopefully that's clear. If you have any issues, just post questions in the chat. Now, um, going back to the survey. So we wanted to get an understanding of who's going to be there today. Um, and so we asked two questions. One was, what is your primary discipline? And this is the results for, that we got. So we see a really strong representation of social sciences and also um, mathematical, physical and life sciences, as well as medical sciences and, and other disciplines as well. And 
We also wanted, we're very interested to see who's there in terms of primary sector. And here we really had a strong representation of people in academia, uh, but also people from nonprofit, from government, and some folks from industry and from other types of nonprofit. So um, that's really helpful to know. And I think also really helpful, uh, something to keep in mind for the discussion going forwards. And from the survey, it was also really clear that we had um, not only people from research generation, but also people from the, the implementation side. So um, that was really great to see. So thank you for that feedback. And thank you also for your free text responses, where you shared some of the challenges you've encountered and some of the, the expectations you have for the symposium. Again, we went through that and tried to incorporate that in some of our panel discussion questions. So now that we have a good sense of who's here today, we're going to move on to our panelists. So the uh, so thank you again to all the panelists that are there today. So I'm really excited about this. So we have Chris Chambers from Cardiff University. We have Kelly Kobe from the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. And then we have Myers Alholz Hiller from the BIH Quest Center for Responsible Research at the Charité. And finally, Sally Tinkle from the Science and Technology Policy Institute in DC. So I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves. Um, so just a couple of minutes, each presenter, uh, each panelist. And then after each panelist, I'm going to come back with a Mentimeter question to just get some feedback from the audience on the topic that that panelist will cover. So we'll just be switching back and forth. But um, yeah, it'll be nice to get a bit of or, or feedback from, from you as well on that. So having said that, I'm going to stop here and pass it on to you, Chris, for the introduction. And after your introduction, I'll follow up with the Mentimeter question. Thank you, yes, and uh, thanks for having me. Welcome, everybody. So I'm Chris Chambers from Cardiff University. I'm a <clears throat> reformed cognitive neuroscientist, I suppose, is the best way to put it. I used to be a primarily specialist academic um, focusing on psychology and neuroscience, but as years have gone on, I've got increasingly interested in meta science and open science reform, and that's really my my main um, role these days is in implementation of various reforms, like registered reports, um, which many of you will have heard of, uh, the top guidelines, the UK Reproducibility Network, and others. Uh, so I've been really involved closely in trying to drive forward these policies, um, and not just advocacy, but also uh, dispassionate reflection on whether they're working as intended. So I think it's really incumbent on all of us who are doing this kind of work to, to try and distance ourselves from the sorts of results we'd like to see from meta science interventions. And so it's just the same way as many of us promote a kind of results agnostic approach to science itself and apply that kind of uh, disciplined approach to looking at the effect of our interventions as well. So I'm quite keen on that. Um, I've got more I can say later about some kind of approaches that I think work quite well and things maybe that work not so well when designing um, interventions in this space. But um, that's my kind of very brief summary of me and, and what I'm all about. Thanks a lot, Chris. So, um, yeah, I'm going to follow directly with our first uh, Mentimeter question, which was on the topic of registered reports. And hopefully you can see it there. Um, so the question is, have you ever done a registered report? Yes, no, or I don't know what a registered report is. All right, already got quite a few answers coming in. We'll give it a bit more time. But I'm seeing the, the no category is being dominant for now. Yeah, I think uh, give this it a couple of cool. seconds. I like this. <laughs> yeah, we can, you know, we thought that these might be uh, little props for discussion. So as, as these will get, whatever the results of these are for each panelist, we can weave it into the discussion overall. Exactly. Do you want yeah. me to explain what registered reports are so we can push that third column down a bit? <laughs> <laughs> if you, uh, yeah, sure. Why don't you take two minutes right now and quickly give yeah, up okay. the, the so, on registered reports? <laughs> I, I'm assuming you're all familiar, we're all familiar with the standard way peer review works where you 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 do your research, you complete, you complete the study or set of studies, um, you analyze your results, interpret them, draw conclusions, and then you write your paper. 
And then that gets peer reviewed and it's evaluated based upon all sorts of criteria, theory, methodology, but crucially also results and conclusions. And, and it's that evaluation that's done on results, which causes a lot of the problems we have in science when it comes to irre reproducibility, in particular publication bias, where journals um, are, are pro predominantly populated with positive results that support hypotheses and negative results get suppressed and various forms of reporting bias where authors are faced with the pressure um, to produce positive findings, uh, essentially fish for those results in their data as, and present them selectively in order to tell a story. Now, registered report seeks to solve this problem at its core by taking the regular review process and splitting it in half and saying, first, we're going to do peer review based upon your protocol before you've done the research. And we're going to evaluate that based upon the theory, the question, the methodology, and the potential implications of the, of the, of the program of work. And then if the journal or platform um, uh, evaluates that positively, then you get an in-principle acceptance, which guarantees publication regardless of outcome. So the idea is that we eliminate from the entire publication and ideally research workflow, um, publication bias and reporting bias. Right, should we move on to the next from there, Dylan? All right, yes, we lost audio on our end for a second, but yeah, no, great, great to see those responses. And thank you, Chris, for, for that brief explanation. All right, then I'll pass it on to Kelly, and then we'll also follow up with another Mentimeter question. Thanks, Kelly. Great. Uh, thank you, Dawin and, and Nick. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here today. Thank you so much for your time and uh, attending the session. Uh, I'm Kelly Kobe. I'm a scientist at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. And uh, I wear a couple of different hats that I'll, I'll mention now in, in this sort of intro. So uh, one of the roles that's relevant to the discussion today is that I'm on the steering committee of DORA, so Declaration on a Research Assessment. So I've been uh, engaged with DORA uh, since late 2019. Uh, at the time, it was the advisory board, but there's been some changes to governance. So now it's a steering committee membership. And uh, for, further to sort of that role, um, at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute, I direct the Meta Research and Open Science Program. Uh, so it's a relatively new role that I've uh, started in. Uh, so really excited to build that up in terms of sort of my independent research in those areas. I'm keen on research uh, related to open science broadly, but uh, right now I'm focused on uh, research around data management and sharing, as well as research on sort of institutional reform and monitoring of open science practices. So, for example, uh, through the development of um, consensus around what we ought to track for institutions and the creation of a da uh, dashboard to automate and track those principles. I'm also a member of Equator Canada. So, uh, when you think of Equator, uh, if you're familiar with it, many people think of reporting guidelines. So I'm interested in sort of reporting quality of research, uh, but also in um, uh, training and education and, and helping support researchers to report their work in a way that's uh, clear and transparent and uh, not uh, spin, for example. Uh, I'll stop there. Uh, just to say, though, I'm, I'm really keen on our uh, discussion today, and I'll be bringing those different perspectives uh, to my responses today. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Kelly. It's great to have you here today. So, um, yeah, transitioning to our next Mentimeter question. So, is your institution signed up to DORA? All right. Very <laughs> Balanced responses in the beginning. Okay. Quite a lot of I don't knows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty balanced, actually. Mm. All right. So quite quite a lot of I don't knows. Um, Maybe, I don't know, Kelly, do you have a brief reaction on this or anything you want to comment on? Yeah, I, I think it's interesting to say, I think uh, certainly a, a criticism sort of levied uh, at Dora by, by some is that, you know, it's uh, simply you just sign your name to a declaration and then you're done. Uh, so obviously that's that's not the goal of the organization or, or the folks that are really committed to it. But I think in practice, that may be what, what's occurring at some institutions. So it may be that 
folks are not aware because there's sort of the there's the buy into the idea, but there's the sort of an inertia where they're they're not actually implementing the the principles of Dora. Um, so if they're not doing that, their community may not even be aware that they've signed it or that they've considered signing it. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. There are quite a few yes responses though, so that's 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 encouraging. Very good. I mean, definitive knows, which means people know that their university is not signed up, which is. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Okay, then um, let's move on to Maya. Floor is yours. Hi, everyone. I'd just like to echo what everyone else has said. Which is thank you for joining us for this conversation today. I am a PhD student at the Quest Center for Responsible Research in Berlin, Germany, and I can't remember the exact word Chris used, but I'm also a reformed or recovering cognitive neuroscientist. But I made this uh, switch, I would say, quite a bit earlier in my career because I already started realizing there were some changes that we needed to do to how research was being done in my field uh, in my master's. So I actually stumbled my way out of academia and into policy work for two years, really working on the implementation side, actually at the organization of our last panelist. And um, now I am doing my PhD in meta research. So this topic of, of, of bridging more basic research questions and applied research questions into implementation and into results agnostic evaluation is, is, is pretty important to me. What I've spent the last uh, three years doing is focusing on clinical trial transparency, uh, which is an incredibly important issue in biomedical research because clinical trials form the basis of uh, evidence-informed medical decision-making. And yet a lot of the trials are, results are never published or are published incredibly delayed. And even though there are laws in place for certain trials, the enforcement has been lackadaisical. We haven't seen um, clinical trialists meeting ethical and sometimes legal guidelines to that. So yeah, a lot of my work has been one, to quantify the issue, and then two, to take that quantification into actual change. Um, and that's something I'm excited to share a bit more about successes and, and failures and existing challenges going forward with, with making those change and transparency. Amazing. Thanks, Maya. So going to, um, oops, I was trying to get to the Mentimeter question again. One second, bear with me. All right. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Sorry about that. So here we go. Um, so because you do some work on, on monitoring practices and communicating that, so does your institution track and communicate any meta-scientific relevant metrics? Oh, okay. For those who say yes, uh, I'd be interested in the chat if you could say what those are. Absolutely. Great point. Yeah. Okay. So we have quite a few uh, people who say that the institution, they're aware that the institution does track and communicate some, some practices. Okay. Yeah. So I think overwhelmingly, yes. Uh, but we, but again, quite, quite, quite a few people say no, and I don't know as well. So again, something to really keep in mind for the discussion and we'll keep track of your responses in the chat as well. Thanks a lot. That's great. Okay, with that, then um, I think a couple of responses coming in still, but I think we can move on to our final panelist. So, um, Sally, on to you. The floor is yours. Oh, Sally, I think you're muted. Thank you for inviting me to be here today. I am not a tech expert, but I will bring the expertise that I have to this group. So I am at the other end of my career. I'm senior in my career here in the United States, and I have moved from having a research laboratory to working in the gov uh, administrative government end of research here in the United States. So at the National Institutes of Health, I worked in administering grants the peer review process, as well as higher level science, ending my career 
uh, in the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. So moving to progressively higher levels of how the government goes about the business of funding and administering research. And I'm now at the Science and Technology Policy Institute, 10 years this month, which is amazing to me. Um, and I'm here because I'm not through helping government do it better, uh, the whole process of funding and enabling and supporting research. Uh, I'm here particularly because I have done a number of publicly available reports for the NIH on their high-risk, high-reward research program. We've evaluated the process, how they call for the research and fund it, as well as the impacts of that research. So I've done evaluation across that spectrum. Uh, and and uh, what I'm interested in providing to this panel today is some work that has been published uh, the first year of a three-year project on the NIH anonymized review process, how they're, the actions that a government agency is trying to take to improve the conduct of research. So, uh, so that's what I bring today. I'm excited to be here and uh, to learn all about uh, the efforts of this group. So thank you for inviting me and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Sally. It's great to have you here today. Um, so um, we have two more Mentimeter questions on this topic and they're coming up right now. So the first one is, have you ever participated in a non-standard granting process? Okay. Yeah, quite a few no's. More yeses than I would have thought them. Yes, absolutely. Many yeses actually. That's I would very... do a yes for this question. I've done a lottery grant thing before. And this is good because we have a follow-up question uh, for this one as well. So I think I don't see so many more responses coming in. So I think I'll just move on to this follow-up question. So if yes, for those who responded yes, was it a successful experience? Yes, no, or not sure? Again, a lot of yeses. That's, that's really interesting. Great. Hmm. Okay, so some people are still thinking about it. <laughs> okay. I think I think that was about the extent of our yeses from the previous yes, slide. Absolutely. That's amazing. Very, very good. I think um I think that's that's it for, for that now. I think also want to thank everyone for adding your feedback in the chat on, on the metrics or practices that your institution is tracking. So we'll keep we'll we'll note that down for the discussion as well. So with that, thanks a lot to all the panelists for this introduction. And I'll pass it back to you, Nick. Yeah. So now um we're gonna move into the sort of standard panel discussion times, Delwin might jump in with um, another Mentimeter question, sort of based on some of the discussions we're having at some point. But um, basically, I'm just going to throw some questions out there and the, the panelists, whoever's sort of interested in uh, offering thoughts on that, whether it's one or all or anything in between of you, that's great. Um, and then we'll just sort of move through um, from there. So you can raise your hand or whatever, and I will, uh, or if no one raises their hand, I might pick on someone. But um, so I guess my first question is in the areas, you know, you're working in, um, how did you first come to understand that this was a problem sort of worth pursuing? And then um, how did you get from problem to solution, uh, to the solution you arrived at and are working at now? So sort of what was the basis for, for getting there, and then how did you get to what the solution is from the problem? I'm happy to have a first go at talking about that, if you like. Sure, go um, for it, Chris. Um, so I, I'm not, I, this may be true of many of us, I think, that that for, for me, uh, it was personal experience, I, you know, because I was trained as a lab scientist and um, was tr trained to play the game that so many of us have to play in order to have a career. And over the years, I think I got increasingly 
um, tired of that and a bit frustrated by the its its arbitrary, capricious nature, and the extent to which aspects of the science I was doing that were completely out of my control, such as the results that I would obtain, and which should be out of my control if I'm doing proper research, were the very aspects upon which I was being evaluated at every turn. Uh, whether I would get a paper accepted would depend on my results. Whether or not I get a grant review to be dependent on how many such papers I published, and so on. Um, and I think it's kind of rage, <laughs> a quiet rage that that prompted me to start thinking more about these issues and stepping back from it. And and that and from that's from you know where, for instance, um, my involvement in register reports came about. And then I think in, in terms of what actually happened to make those changes take place i think a lot of that is luck and it's timing who 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 else is doing this at the same time social media has been hugely important in connecting us in ways that were not possible 20 30 40 years ago the issues that we were talking about about lack of reproducibility lack of open practices lack of reliability transparency these are not new they've been these have been discussed since the 1950s and 60s why now why why did things change now well i think the ability to simply talk to each other more easily and to work together rather than being little isolated silos of activity uh, has been hugely impactful. And, and, and that combined with a certain element of luck means that things can just happen. Um, and it's difficult to say exactly why or what deep strategy you'd build on that, except don't ignore your own sense of inner frustration, like act on it and, and see what, you, what levers you can pull yourself to make change. I'll jump in here next because of uh, the work that I'm doing on uh, for NIH on an the anonymized review process directly addresses some of Chris's frustrations and frustrations that we all felt. Even when I was uh, managing the review process, frustrations on my part at a flawed process because the idea of meritorious research uh, is very nebulous. Uh, and we, you all have seen the publications where that show that uh, there is bias in the process based on gender, uh, based on age, uh, based on uh, race and ethnicity. And so uh, all of those, it's not just about science in who gets the grants. And so that was part of my frustration that that follows on to Chris's frustration from uh, another perspective and trying to create a remedy for uh, some of these biases. I'm constrained by the fact that I need to do it in a way that is uh, intellectually rigorous uh, and statistically sound in order to convince government uh, that changes need to be made and what changes should be made. So um, I just wanted to share that part of that whole flawed process. I can jump in too. So just to extend on uh, Chris and Sally's uh, great comments, uh, my experience has been quite similar. Uh, I, I think that, you know, the notion that I felt in graduate studies was that I was willing to work hard. I was willing to work long hours, uh, but not to produce the research that I felt was not rigorous, not powered. You know, everyone kept telling me I was doing such a great job. I was getting grants. I was publishing papers. I was doing everything right. But I knew that what I was producing wasn't adding value to the scientific literature or, or adding it in an optimal way. So uh, that certainly from a personal perspective really, really resonates with, uh, I think, what Chris and Sally have indicated as well. Um, from the perspective of DORA, I think uh, it, it was pretty much the momentum that uh, these folks have talked about, uh, not just from individual researchers, but also from societies and funders and uh, different stakeholders coming together to, to raise the flag and say, you know, there's something wrong with the way we're being assessed. It's not supporting uh, optimal uh, scientific uh, rigor and processes. And the fact that, you know, our systems of scientific assessment, uh, they were not developed scientifically in any way, right? So uh, they were developed in in from from old boys clubs and uh, you know systems that were in, inherently biased and um, not perhaps thought out. They sort of just evolved over time and uh, don't meet the needs of our scientific community. So I think Dora, you know, uh, really brought the community together with diversity of different stakeholders and uh, raised that issue. And I think, of course. 
uh, the, the first step is, is raising the problem. You know, many researchers feel it. Now we've raised it as a sort of community or more dynamic group. Uh, and that uh, awareness raising, I think, is really critical. And the next step is, of course, uh, addressing uh, that and coming up with uh, solutions and, and monitoring those solutions over time. Uh, I want to just say, though, um, I think that in, in talking about sort of like the problem in, in the research ecosystem, especially as it pertains to research assessment, uh, I think we have to be cognizant of jurisdictional differences. Uh, so, you know, there, there's a sense I get that, you know, people in Europe, uh, for example, who may be further ahead in the open science meta uh, science uh, sphere, uh, may be really focused on, you know, coming up with solutions. Uh, in Canada, I sometimes uh, I feel I, I actually did my training and, and worked in Europe for almost a decade. And when I returned to Canada, it was almost like a, a return to the Stone Ages uh, in terms of people's awareness of the problems in, in the academic uh, reward system and their uh, willingness to sort of bring evidence uh, to the fore around those. So um, I think that uh, while we need to be solution oriented, we shouldn't completely dismiss the need for education and awareness raising uh, as a first step to, to make people aware of the problem. So certainly in institutions that I've consulted for or liaised with, uh, many, for instance, administrators, uh, if we take like the impact factor or the H index, uh, they, they use them, but they don't know what they are. They don't know how they're calculated. They don't know what their biases are. And I think still having that education and raising uh, the problem in certain communities still has value at this point. Um, I would love to jump on that point of of thinking about the environment that you're working in. I think that that is uh, maybe twofold. One is what the jurisdiction or what is able to be changed because there is a formal infrastructure for it. And I think the other is having um, having an environment which supports you to take the time to try to make those changes, um, which aren't always lined up. So I am I'm now based in Germany. I was before in the U.S., I have to say that in terms of clinical trial transparency practices, there, there are countries that are further along in making these changes. But in terms of actually being able to solve a problem, I am here at an institute that has decided to invest resources in doing this work because all of us are taking time. We've all left the research field that we were working in before, and we are now spending our time looking at science as a system instead of looking at the systems we originally were. So I think, I think it's twofold. I think, yes, jurisdictions can be a challenge if they don't have maybe a legal basis for what you're trying to change or they don't have the, the, the support within the legal framework. But if you're at a place that, that you can actually make the change, um, th I mean, th that can help. And I think that's also going back to your question, Nick, about how do you go from finding a problem to, to, to finding a solution. Um, I didn't come to clinical trial transparency because this was the problem I was aware of. I left cognitive neuroscience because I saw similar underpowered studies. I was working with fMRI with 20 people making huge conclusions that I, I didn't understand how we were getting to statistically, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and I have just gone towards places where I can make a change. And that means that I have changed my topical focus. But I think that there's so much so much we can, so much reform we can implement in changing the scientific ecosystem. That for me, choosing to go to environments that are ready for change is is, is more powerful than necessarily focusing on a single specific topic. Yeah. So I want to move us now to a little, like a couple of potential questions um, about stakeholders and stakeholder engagement as we're trying to, because that's such a big part of implementing any of these things, because we're working in a complex system with uh, lots of different stakeholders and lots of blame, plenty of blame to go around. And uh, people in the metastatic community, like I said earlier, are not shy about placing that blame, but eventually sort of you need to get everyone to stop passing the buck and actually start acting. And I'm really interested as um, in your work, in all of your work as you're dealing with trying to either build a consensus or build momentum or um, change policy, uh, whether that be for individuals, for institutions, on national or international levels. Um, what was your sort of, just to start us off here, so like what are your first steps for identifying uh, which stakeholders you felt you feel like you should have, like, you know, you should be targeting to get your idea off the ground 
Um, and then I'll follow on with a couple other questions about stakeholders after that, but we'll start there. Um, I would say, look at the gate. Who's, who's controlling the gates? I, I, I always look at gatekeepers, and there are basically three in, in our work. Um, journals and publishers is kind of one set. Funders are another, and institutions are another. So universities, and of course, institutions can be broader than that. Uh, and there are, I think there are additional stakeholders as well in industry that can play a role as well. But I think the, the, the core here is really those three. So I, I began um, certainly with registered reports in looking to see who would be in the best position to support this new article type, which eliminates bias. Um, and that at the time was uh, was academic publishers. Um, we've since moved away from that. And actually, it's one of the interesting I think aspects of this is over time, uh, as an initiative gains a bit of steam, I think it can actually ha uh, have its own wings and it doesn't need to rely on uh, existing structures so much. I think existing structures are useful often for getting an idea off the ground, but they can also hold you back. And also there's a danger that if your initiative is successful, it can strengthen those existing structures in a way which is actually detrimental to the community. Um, so, you know, I think that there's also a point at which you, you try and look to tr um, to uh, promote the initiative beyond those structures, um, as we did with registered reports. But I think to answer your question for me, it's certainly looking at the gatekeepers. Ryan. I'm going to jump in here Go ahead, to, real quick because I, I don't know if it's my job to challenge another statement, but Chris, what is the basis for you saying that the registered report eliminates bias? Ha, has that been analyzed? Because I found in doing oh, diversity and demographic change in the grant process that there are a lot of assumptions about the process, about grants and awards that I'm not able to track down and find to be valid. There are assumptions that we make. So I just want to track that when you say that that process eliminates bias. We have tested ourselves. We have checked ourselves. Yeah, no, thanks, Sally. Great question. So I'm talking about particularly publication bias and reporting bias. I'm not talking about um, other forms of bias. There's so many. You know, as you rightly point out, there's bias against certain demographics in the scientific process and all sorts of EDI issues linked to that. I'm specifically talking about publication bias where um, journals um, uh, selectively report positive results, so results that support the hypothesis or which report statistically significant effects, and reporting bias where uh, researchers feel pressured to, to selectively analyze their own data to produce such findings even when they're likely to be false positives. So I'm not making any claims whatsoever about other types of bias. In terms of the evidence for the specific times, types of bias I'm talking about um, being addressed in registered reports, we have got emerging meta-scientific evidence that uh, the rate of positive results produced by registered reports is dramatically less than the standard literature. So depending on the field that you're in, the rate of positive findings um, in the life and social sciences ranges from around 80% to nearly 100%. Um, which is um, unrealistically high if that literature reflects the true state of reality. When we look at the uh, the distribution of such findings in registered reports where those biases are in theory eliminated, that rate of positive results drops down to around 40 to 50%. Um, and so that that's the first of really emerging evidence that it works. Um, I, I don't have a direct response to that comment, but to what you were saying about the three gatekeeper groups, I, I mean, those are definitely, again, those were, you said journals, publishers, funders, and institutions. And for us, those have definitely been, uh, organizations or for us specific organizations within those stakeholder groups that we've targeted. But, but I, I would, I would challenge this to say that even, stakeholders who may say, oh, I don't have power, um, do actually have more power than they see fit. And they also have strong incentives that may may speak against their reforming their behaviors. So for example, um, as an early career researcher, there's it's a highly vol volatile world for me. It's scary. If I say no, I'm going to I'm going to work a lot of 
a long time to make sure that my code is entirely reproducible and I'm going to get it into a Docker container and I'm, you know, I'm going to spend my time doing that and I'm going to come out with one good publication instead of three. Um, but I still can choose to do that. And I think that one, one way to act is also to find the few leaders out there who are willing to take risks, who have whatever circumstances that are allowing them to take risks. And I think that's one of the approaches that we've been able to tack onto as an institution that's based at a, within a medical university is that sometimes we just find one uh, clinical trial leader. So who's a medical doctor and a professor who is more open to taking some risks. And again, they have less risk than an early career researcher, but still more risk than a funding agency that isn't an individual person, you know, as an anonymous, more anonymous body. Um, so I would say for us, we've, we've taken specifically two stakeholder groups as our focus so far. We've targeted institutions. So we've created an institutional dashboard and then we've used um, not a traditional research method to disseminate it. We are having workshops. We are having stakeholder engagement events. We're bringing people into phone calls. We're getting their thoughts on what they think of, of whether this is usable, whether this is a terrible idea, but having those conversations with institutional leadership. At the same time, we are running a study with individual trialists where we say, here's, here's what your trial looks like. Here's, here's where you're doing things right. Here's where you're not. And here's how you can still improve. And yeah, we're not expecting an overwhelming change because we're asking people to do unrewarded work. But we think that if there's enough, enough of this increased awareness of these, and this is tying back onto what you said, Kelly, before about increasing awareness, that there might be one or two or three people who start changing this behavior. And slowly, if we're taking this multi-stakeholder approach, like these will, will come together. Um, I will also highlight that we are starting now a project where we're going to be targeting funders um, more specifically because we think that they they have an incentive to make sure that the trials that they're funding actually get published. Um, so we're we're gonna try that extra, that that new stakeholder group approach now. Yeah. I think the, these are such great points, Maya. They're really resonating with me. I, I, I know from my own perspective in terms of engaging stakeholders for, for my own meta research, um, I actually don't find it, it hard to engage stakeholders. I find uh, there is in my community, there's some growing interest and awareness uh, about issues, for example, if, uh, around research assessment or around implementing open science. Um, there's a difference, though, between people wanting to engage and meaningful engagement. So uh, sometimes uh, to, to take the step from, you know, uh, being aware or being interested in being aware and wanting to be like part of the discussion and actually moving forward. Uh, one like big gap is resources and that can be like fiscal resources, depending on the stakeholder or personnel resources um, or in, in the Canadian context, I, I find it's actually expertise. So there's, I find in, in our jurisdiction, like a lack of expertise in meta research, meta science, uh, open science policy. And as a consequence, um, you know, you can bring everyone together but to actually move from, you know, having people sitting around a table to actually getting something done uh, can be challenging if you, you don't have the right expertise and skill sets or experiences uh, in, in the room. Uh, when it comes to DORA, obviously DORA has like a very open call. Uh, they place a lot of emphasis, in, in, especially in their new strategic plan around uh, EDI and uh, the considerations of inclusivity. Um, they do a ton of community engagement, so they publish blogs to uh, make stakeholders aware of what they're doing, organize interviews, uh, presentations, and, and so on on research assessment. Uh, they're developing resources, so that's a great way, uh, I think, to engage stakeholders is to give them tools um, to, to help them and support them. And uh, those tools are developed in partnership with organizations, which is really important. So it's not a, a case of uh, just giving uh, tools out to a community and hoping they resonate. It's actually sort of a user-centered design where they're, they're developed with the community. Um, DOOR also does a lot of advising to academic institutions and places a strong emphasis on, on convening stakeholders at conferences and in sessions like the one we're having today. And I think those are really important in um, identifying new stakeholders and continuing that discussion and, and creating that engagement in our community. Because at the end of the day, uh, many of the practices we're talking about, whether it's, you know, implementing reforms on researcher assessment, uh, implementing registered reports, uh, improving trial reporting, improving grant reporting, um, it, it, all of this is behavior change at the end of the day. So uh, we need to have stakeholders engaged and 
uh, you know, there's scientific processes to uh, uh, look at things like implementation science and to create behavior change. So uh, rather than just sort of thinking like, oh, what, what should we do? I think we actually have to lean on these people with those expertise and ensure that we have sort of monitoring of our stakeholder engagement and the actual decisions on around implementation as well. I think that's the really key to make sure that we're not just sort of a bunch of folks with like good intentions to move this sort of meta science initiative forward. Uh, we're actually monitoring and knowing that what we're doing is actually having the effect that we want it to as a community and that that effect over time is sustained. Nick, may I respond directly to that point? That's, sure, go for it. Um, Cause I think that that ties into a challenge that we faced, which is on the one hand, I don't know if there's a specific meta science skill set, but realizing that what we're doing is so broad, we're going from very basic uh, web scraping, super technical work, all the way to that very human side of theory of behavior change and implementation science. And we can't, one person can't do everything. Like we just don't have the resources to get skilled and everything. I, I deeply believe that we can get better at something, but I, at the same time, I can't get so good at the qualitative skills so that I get proper user-centered design for the tools that I'm developing at the same time as I'm creating the back end of the tools at the same time that I'm in meetings with high level stakeholders to, to get them to adopt the tools. And I think, um, yeah, that's been a, a challenge for us is to one, identify specifically those needs and then to find that expertise and also to figure out how to fund that expertise because also with the the challenges and maybe Sally also you know more about how grants work but um there's limited ways that you can use funding and a lot of the work that we're doing now is um be goes beyond the traditional way of organizing a research project so yeah and I'm gonna uh add on to Maya's comment uh part of it's for clarification on my part uh, so you talk about behavior change in stakeholders, but from my perch in the world, looking across uh, U.S. government, there's a significant obstacle in policy change. So you can change the behaviors of your applicants in your research community and the university all you want, but the funders have got to change the process. There have got to be policy changes. Um, and maybe you're defining those, Kelly, as behavior changes, and I'm not. Um, so, I, so I'm a little confused there because I, I come from a very uh, concrete perspective of the process has to be changed, and then the people follow. So. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. I think it's it's super fascinating, Sally. Obviously, we're we're in different jurisdictions and and things. The processes may be different. So I guess there's there's different approaches. So there's there's the idea of like a grassroots initiative, uh, and then there's of course the top down. And I think there's probably place for both of this in in terms of reform. So hearing you say, you know, um, that that the funders need policies. And uh, we, we need policies as, as a, a starting point, and then maybe some education and implementation of those policies. Uh, I think to me, like, that makes sense. I, I agree. But it just doesn't jive with my experience, at least in my system in Canada, in terms of successful implementation. So, for example, in, in Canada, our tri-agencies, our largest uh, federal funders of, of research, uh, they've got lots of policies. They've got, in some cases, I think, good policies. Um, in some cases, I think their policies are perhaps not specific enough, but to give an example uh, that may interest Maya around like clinical trials reporting. So like most jurisdictions in the world, we have a mandate to uh, register and report our clinical trials in a uh, registry. And um, until very recently, like this year, um, the wording around the policy specific to uh, reporting the results was that researchers uh, had to report the results of the trial in the registry where it was registered uh, without uh, undue delay. Uh, so you try to enforce without undue delay. Uh, at institutions where I went in and audited who'd finished reporting their trials registered and reported them, like it's impossible. You, you email someone and say, uh, you know, you ought to do this. The policy is that you should do it without undue delay. Well, 
some of the senior scientists I spoke to felt 18 years was not undue delay. Uh, so it was very challenging. And for instance, uh, we have similar policies around uh, open access. So uh, we're, again, we're behind the curve in terms of uh, immediate open access, but we have this sort of 12 month embargo period where we ought to have things done. Uh, there's absolutely no monitoring of, of this. There's no monitoring of trials either. Our group published an audit of Canadian trials. They're, they're not being reported uh, in, in their registries uh, like half the time. And uh, something that may interest you, Sally, is that uh, when we look at Canadian trials that had an American site involved, so like one site was in America, we're better at reporting our trials in registries then because you guys sort of lift us up. Your culture of, of reporting is, is different than ours. Uh, so I think, yes, we need policy, but I think more, more so we need uh, quality implementation of a policy and audit. It, it may exist uh, in, in certain jurisdictions for certain practices, it's not the case in Canada. We, we do not monitor uh, the vast majority of our policies. There was a recent survey uh, this past year of grantees from the Canadian uh, Institutes of Health Research. Anyone who got uh, uh, funding to do a trial, they sent them a survey about registration and results reporting and so on. And the report is it's, it's uh, comical almost. It, it says they have a really hard time uh, with response rate. I mean, you're the funder. You can, you can demand that people report this information to you, right? This is not an optional survey. If you want to uh, enforce your policies, there are steps you can take to, to get this done to 100%, right? Or, or, or very close. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Um, the, the rant must end. But um, I, I think, yeah, there, there are definitely jurisdictional differences and, and policy is important, but policy alone will not get us towards successful implementation. So, um... Keeping this conversation going to an extent, um, I'm really interested too in, in about dealing with stakeholders. How, you know, I think Sally challenging Chris on what's the evidence for um, registered reports reducing bias is indicative of sort of what I'm talking about with this question. So if you were present, if Sally were the decision maker and the stakeholder you needed to convince, she might really care and focus about the evidence. And I mean, I think this is particularly interesting because we're working within science where everyone is supposed to care about the evidence and the quality of the evidence to support something. Um, but also for just reflecting from my own work on trial reporting, you do, evidence isn't always enough, right? We have plenty of evidence of lots of things that work, but no one does um, in one way or another, or doesn't implement, or that might be effective. So there's obviously, it's not enough. The evidence alone is not enough to make these changes. So I'm thinking about in my own work, you know, when we're talking about trying to convince people one way or another to care or do something about trial reporting, you can give all the evidence about how we can't effectively evaluate interventions, but you also might need to appeal to um, sort of ethical aspects saying, you know, we're reducing research waste. And also uh, all these people participated in this trial and put themselves in harm's way. Uh, and it would be sort of um, just doing them a disservice to not report the, the research, um, which are very different appeals than simply saying, like, we can't do a systematic review, you know, uh, that's accurate. So I'm wondering... Um, in all of yours experience of, of working with these stakeholders and trying to convince them, um, has it made in within science, you know, has it mainly been appeals to evidence or is it appeals to lots of other things as well? And what are those other things? I think that's a great question. If I can just jump in there. I mean, you mentioned that um, evidence is not enough. And if I can say something slightly controversial, I also think that it's not always necessary either, particularly when you're starting out. I remember when we first proposed the idea of register reports and one of the objections that some journals would give to us as a reason for not adopting it was because there was no evidence that it worked. And you're never going to get the evidence that it works unless you adopt it and try it first. So you can end up in a kind of loop. I think particularly when you're trying to get an idea off the ground, appealing to logic and, and, uh, and philosophy and ethics and these kinds of things is actually quite a, is certainly very valuable. And then once things are going, then the process of evaluating the evidence becomes crucial. But I think sometimes uh, opponents of reform use the evidence barrier as a way of resisting change. They say, we're not doing anything until you show us the evidence that it's better than the status quo. And my response to that is always two things. Number one, if you don't try it, you'll never get the evidence. And number two, what is the evidence that the status quo works? And there is usually none. 
If you look at the regular peer review process and you ask people, why do you do it this way? What's the evidence that this approach is best? You will get silence. It's just the way it is. So we have to be very careful about that sort of status quo bias, which um, can make any change uh, uh, an insurmountable prospect. You know, you, you, we've got to make sure that we look at things on their merits. And sometimes I think that means saying evidence at the beginning is not the most important criteria to be considering. Um, I find that very interesting because I think that it also resonates with people who are willing to take risks, individuals or organizations, even when there, there isn't evidence. And actually, that's making me think of we need a high risk, high risk, high reward program for for meta research implementation also. So, um, I, yeah, maybe that's something that NIH should should consider. Um, but, um, yeah, I think I think a powerful tool that some of my colleagues at, at the Quest Center have tapped onto is, is more connecting through through emotions. Um, and I think that's especially in, in the space of clinical trial transparency, you have existing groups that are, are, are working far from the logical space and they are patient advocacy groups. And I think we actually see quite a few of, of these projects on pediatric studies because man, children are dying and we're burying those results. That's, that, that pulls at the heartstrings. And so I think one of the powerful tools for, for implementation here is evidence aside is, is tapping into patient engagement groups that are existing, that, that want to engage in the research, and that we should also be engaging in our meta research because we're, we're already asking trialists to get them to engage in their research. And if we get them to engage in our research, they can take our data um, and they can they can use it for their advocacy work. I think this is also something I think about a lot is where's the line um, for a scientist versus an advocate? Is there a line? Um, how much can I argue beyond beyond the evidence? The evidence is my comfortable zone, uh, but in the end, yeah, it's it's blurry. So one tool that we have used is collaborating with people who are in more of that that advocacy space who are working on 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 on, on emotions instead, and um, saying here's our data, uh, help us help us disseminate this message in in a way that that you you can you can take it so that it gives us somewhat the space uh, to 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 play both roles. Yeah. Uh, can I jump in here? Oh, Kelly, did you want to go? You go ahead, Sally. I'll jump in after. Um, I, I'm not, uh, when I listen to this, nobody on this panel is wrong. Everybody has points to make uh, and they're all valid. And these are parallel paths. So when we think about which stakeholder groups to talk to and we talk to them in parallel because we're trying to bring about a systems change. Uh, so it has to come from multiple components. The one that we haven't brought up from my very uh, jaded perspective in Washington, D.C., after all of these years, I just want to own that, um, is how the process is incentivized. So one of your parallel tracks that is really the most potent to change behavior is where you put your money. If we did not give a block grant uh, for $5 million for a clinical trial and we said, Step one, you get this much money. Once you've published your results or you've met the steps Kelly was describing for disclosing your data, then you get another chunk of money. I'm making this up as we go here. I don't know anybody that's going to do it, but I do know it's why I worked in program. Wherever I put the money, that's where the science went. So uh, I would just like to put that out there as a parallel track to consider in, uh, alongside of the uh, stakeholder engagements that you're talking about, because it, it, it's unfortunate, but that's uh, a major player. Just to uh, really quickly, process. before we go to Kelly, just respond directly to Sally. I was actually having a conversation with a colleague in France the other day, and just, I know you were just speaking in a hypothetical terms, but let's just pretend we were implementing that policy, right? So France, the main funder of clinical time in France, I believe, does have something like that, where they withhold 10% of your funding until you report. 
And apparently even that isn't enough. People <laughs> at times would rather not get the 10% of the funding than report their clinical trial correctly, apparently. And I don't know, maybe there's ways to claw back that 10% by people who know the system, but it's just, and I, get, I don't make that point to say you had a bad example. That's not what I'm saying at all, but merely that it just shows the complications in thinking about when you're trying to implement these things where you're like, oh, if we withhold 10%, everyone's going to do it. Everyone's going to want that money. And even that might not be enough. So first of all, I'm going to tell you 10% is way too low. It's got to be like 40%. You've got to make it hurt, which is sad, but true. I'm a pragmatist. Um, and it's not the, that's why I talk about parallel paths. It's just one track to change that I think should be acknowledged along with the other behavior changes that we we're encouraging behavior change is what we're doing. But I, I acknowledge that, but reach the level where they're going to pay attention and do it. We had the same problem for years. And Maya can probably speak to this about data sharing in the U S we made a rec the agencies made a recommendation that federally funded research data should be made public. Nobody did it. You know, but now we're changing that behavior. At, uh, we're changing the incentive on that and on winning your grant. And it's incremental. But, you know, the, all of this is going to be very slow. But I take your point, Nick. Thank you. Uh, great, great points. There's so many uh, interesting things being discussed here. I think I, I want to jump on some of the things Sally has just mentioned because they, they resonated with me with respect to funding uh, or sort of resources more broadly. Um, I think when, when I'm working with stakeholders and I know when, when Dora works with uh, stakeholders as well, uh, when we're looking to implement things or, or make change, uh, one thing that you can do is exactly that is provide resources. So for instance, uh, Dora is, uh, they have uh, community grants that folks can apply to. So when you have people engaged, you want to move them from engagement to action, uh, providing them with funding to implement something or pilot something can be a first step. There's also, uh, for instance, like Project Terra, uh, which is uh, Tools to Advance Research Assessment. Uh, it's uh, a number of different um, resources. There's survey results from across the states. Um, there's a, a repository of uh, examples of, of folks changing research assessment. There's also, uh, separate from that, DORA maintains uh, some case examples of institutions that have implemented research or reform. And I think these types of uh, resources, they're really essential because if you have a stakeholder engaged um, and you want to keep them engaged and, and move them towards uh, action, uh, sometimes when, when you're working with, uh, in, in my case, research administrators, it can seem like an overwhelming task and no one wants to go first because it's a lot of work to go first. So if you can give an institution either uh, resources in the form of funding or an individual resources in the form of funding um, or tools, uh, I think that can be really helpful to uh, progress them forward. Uh, even if uh, you know the, the tool, for instance, uh, may need to be modified to their institution, uh, it could be that that gets them beyond thinking about doing this to actually having a concrete plan and a little bit of um, resources uh, to move them forward towards implementation. I find in the absence of tools or examples, uh, when it comes to research or reform or, or implementing some of the uh, open science policies that I've done at institutions, it's just, it's too big, the, the, it's too conceptual. The, the folks in the decision-making uh, spot often don't have the expertise either. They may be warm to the idea or appreciate we need to do this, but just don't know where to begin. So these types of resources I think are key. Um, so to move us, um, there was a question in the chat from um, Ozger, Ozer, I'm very sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, and they asked specifically about, uh, they asked, do elite researchers, you know, PIs and supervisors that have power on early career researchers play a role as gatekeepers for, for you know, um, assessing this change? And I think that that gets to a point um, that I wanted that I wanted to address too about overcoming sort of the institutional inertia that can stand in the way of a lot of this these changes, uh, especially in science, which, you know, despite being where we get uh, a lot of our societal advancement from is an inherently uh, conservative, um, in a lot of ways, institution. Uh, I, when you talk about the mechanics of these large scale uh, systematic change we're talking about. Um, so, have you found, like, has that institutional inertia been a big barrier for you at any level, at the level of the individual researcher, at the level of institutions, at the level of national and supranational bodies? 
And uh, what strategies ha have you employed to overcome that uh, inertia? That's a great question. If I can just jump in quickly, I'll, I won't be long. I, 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 yes, it's a huge issue. So I think uh, if you look at a department and you look at the sort of hierarchical structure of, of academic departments across most of the world, um, there's, there can often be a small minority of senior people which hold disproportionate power over decision making. And um, early career researchers who wish to uh, adopt more open practices often find this a barrier in convincing their their PIs to try something different or to overcome misconceptions and, and whatnot. And I think we, we encountered this very directly early on in the life of registered reports because no sooner had we had we proposed the idea than about 100 senior researchers went on the attack and tried to kill it. Um, and some of you are familiar with the history of the initiative will remember all of this kind of brouhaha that happened back in 2013 over this. Um, and at the time, I, you know, I thought, wow, this is quite something. I mean, what, why such an emotional response from all these senior people? In terms of strategies, I figured out something very important, which is that um, there are certain people whose minds you will never change, and it's futile to try. It's better to change the environment around them uh, in such a way that if they don't change, then they lose something. It's the old carrot and the stick. And, and if you focus on that approach, you find that there are plenty of people who are willing to try something different and are willing to change. And and that's not just the junior researchers, but also there are a lot of senior researchers also who are very, uh, in, very motivated to try and improve science for the sake of the next generation uh, and their own work. So I think finding the friendly people um, in the crowd, and also this is really simple, that just sticking around. I think a lot of the opponents to reforms don't have a lot of patience. They don't want to fight a war. They don't have the resources all the time. And if you just persist... And if you're still there five years, 10 years later, making the same arguments, you will simply starve them to death, just put it, to put it bluntly, and they run out of steam and you end up winning the argument. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure there's any great wisdom from any of that, except keep trying. And, I, and my message to early career researchers who are facing these barriers is, you know, if you can't make the changes that you want to make because you've got a PI who won't let you, it's not your fault. I think you have to maybe suffer that for a while, but then when it comes to the next stage in your career, actively look for a supportive environment that that will help you, you know, do the best science you can. I oh, go ahead, Maya. Um, I really appreciate those those points, and I think what you said about focusing on the people who are open to change um, ties into to what I was saying. We were we were trying to do, which is finding those two PIs who are willing to change. But I think. We have to go back to Kelly's point about resources, because even those open people are open to it to the extent that it doesn't mess with the incentive structure that they're functioning in. Also tying back into what Sally was saying, which is, I mean, there are people who are just fully closed. I'm not going to waste my time on, but there are the people who are who are fine with it, but it just can't take any more time than what we're currently doing. So if you can figure out how to do a registered report and not make the peer review before we start the project, take any time, sure, do it. Um, and I think this is where we have this resources issue. And I, I don't have a solution to this. I have a massive barrier because we don't, we are, the Quest Center is a research institute. So we are connected to the institutional resources that support clinical trials, but we have no power over them. We have conversations, we made them co, uh, co I don't know, co-experimenters in our study. We've gotten their buy-in but we don't know how to get them any more money. So the trialists who are open to making change, they say, yes, please, but I need help. And our response is, sorry, like here's a hyperlink that we can give you, but we cannot give you someone at the clinical trial office who will do that support. Again, this is where the systemic approach is important because the UK, and I know Nick can talk more about this, but the UK has seen quite a bit of change because Parliament came down and said, okay, institutions do it. And then they each hired someone to be responsible for clinical trial transparency. So um, yeah, that's the openness with resources. I also want to push back on this sticking around point that you brought up, Chris, where I think there is a challenge, again, with stability for us as people within academia. I am working on uh, like uh, third party funding in Germany. So I work on grants and most of my institute works on grants. We have some people in permanent positions who are not professors, but I have no stability. So I am still playing the game to survive. And the honest truth is I would love to keep working on this individual trialist work that I've been doing for the past three years, 
And I can't because my next grant is to work on funders. So all this relationship building that I've worked on, I officially have no time to work on it as of June 1st. That's really hard. It makes it, it makes me not the strongest player in this. And, and, and yeah, I, I, I'm trying to figure this out. I know, I know also we've got some people who are in the audience who have left academia and continue to work on these issues saying, okay, what if I work in another sector? Will that offer me the stability and the staying power? But yeah, this is definitely an, another challenge. Yeah, I, I want to jump in. Uh, these these points are, are super relevant, and and for for me, and just feel I'm just nodding the whole time uh, in agreement. So um, the the point about sort of persisting uh, resonated with me. So I think I'm a few years ahead in in sort of my career stage uh, than you, but I, I still feel that you know I have a permanent so so to speak position now, but uh, you know there's not a lot of funding to to do what we do in in my uh, arena, and you know it's 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 very challenging. Uh, but Chris, your, your comment about persisting uh, resonated with me because I work uh, very closely with uh, David Moore, who is a mentor and uh, collaborator. And um, he frequently says, uh, you know, we just have to keep going. And, we, you know, we have to every everything we do, we hear no, 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 no. And uh, we just keep going. And eventually someone says maybe or yes. And, and we keep going and we make progress like this. And, you know, I think he he has said, you know, this change may not happen in his career. But it, he's hopeful it'll happen in mine. And, uh, you know, so the, the persisting may even be like across generations to make this change. Right. And uh, I, I think that we, we shouldn't at the same time as, as we feel we're not having the sort of revolutionary change we, we want to have. We shouldn't, uh, I think, be completely pessimistic because I think really amazing things have happened, particularly in psychology as a discipline, but um, at, at different federal jurisdictions in terms of uh, uh, funding and, and policy. Like we're moving in the right direction. And I think a, a lesson for me in terms of, you know, wanting revolutionary change and, and getting incremental change um, was I uh, hosted, uh, along with a colleague, uh, Manoj Lalu, a workshop on uh, preclinical study design and reporting. We were super excited about this. We poured our heart and soul into uh, creating really interesting uh, examples of sort of, you know, uh, power uh, and when, when doing things, uh, everything from like animal husbandry uh, to uh, reporting our, our results in, in a clear and transparent way and examples that were taken from the literature that were poor and, and how to do it right. And our attendees were uh, graduate students and research staff at our institution. And it went really well. We felt like so energized and empowered afterwards. People had like solutions to take and uh, implement. And we had them back uh, a couple months later for sort of part two and an update on how they'd done with regards to the initial session. And what we found, which was exactly the comment in the chat, was that uh, supervisors were a complete barrier and that, you know, although they left feeling empowered, knowing what to do and wanting to implement, uh, their supervisors didn't want them spending time on this, didn't understand what we were talking about. Uh, and I thought that was really, really disheartening at the time, but also we've worked to make incremental change. So rather than adopting a whole suite of practices, they went back and did one thing that year that changed and increased the rigor of what they were doing. And, you know, that's maybe not ideal, but it's better than no things. So uh, I've had to change my really sort of optimistic uh, desire for like speed uh, and, and revolution. I, I've had to harness that back sometimes in certain conversations and do what's practical. I just want to point out that I think Chris is going to leave us for childcare right now, but we're just about wrapping up anyway. Yes, I am uh, so sorry. But thank no you so worries. much for, and for the great discussion. Yeah, thanks a lot, Chris. Um, I I want to kick it back over to Delwin in a sec, but I just want to ask one last question, and maybe I'll just go rapid be between these three uh, panelists and just say each of you just give like a short little answer to this as a wrap up question, but. Um, can you define what success looks like uh, for your goals, and then and 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 then then once you reach that success, how do you determine what comes to the next thing? That might be a lot. You can, but let's not. You know, uh, I want to leave time for for Delwin to wrap up. Um, but just to give a very quick thing, you know, the all trials campaign is something my mentor and boss Ben Goldacre set up. That all trials reported, all trials registered. Um, that was about 10 years ago. He was he had to fight opposition from all quarters of, of academia and industry. And now uh, they just announced that the new clinical trial legislation in the UK is going to have 
clear registration and reporting requirements built in with broad support. So just uh, like a, a win, a win of the, this sort of thing moving forward and how persistence and like um, capability, you know, as Maya said, it's not always easy to keep that momentum going. But so, yeah, so what does success look like for you in the area you're working on? And then how do you transition to the next thing? So Kelly, let's start with you. Uh, sure. I, I think um, so from, I guess, like a Dora perspective, uh, Dora has a new strategic plan and uh, you can check that out. It's from uh, 2023 uh, for the next uh, three years. And I think um, one thing that they're looking to do is to actually support advocates of research assessment worldwide. Um, so really moving from the sort of buy in and getting awareness and in, in certain pockets, actually moving towards um creating uh, support for advocates. So that will include a, a DORA advocate toolkit and uh, trying to grow the online community for DORA. And uh, they'll continue, for instance, DORA's in engagement grants. Um, I think as well, uh, another uh, key uh, sort of next step in terms of uh, reform will actually be, as, as it's come up so many times, is securing funding for DORA uh, to persist, uh, as Chris has said, uh, in the longer term. Uh, funding is really essential, I think, for the professionalization of, of DORA uh, to have core staff that are actually paid to sort of get things off the ground. Um, I think, to, to be honest, uh, my, my own perspective as a meta researcher, uh, my goals would, would be similar. So to, to get funding to sustain what I'm doing and, um, you know, pu push, push forward uh, tools and resources for the community to, to move us closer to this goal of openness and transparency. Maya. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll push back on, on, on getting funding for, for, for our jobs because sometimes I think that my big picture success goal is making my job disappear. I would love to be out of work because I, I, I don't think that uh, this should be a topic, the specific uh, try and get clinical trials to report. So that's the big picture success that uh, is far, far away. But I actually am going to uh, go back to this point you brought up before of wanting to engage versus meaningful engagement. And I would say that wanting to engage itself is a success. So seeing that people are open to the idea is already a step forward. And I, I think it's easy for me to forget that and say, oh my God, we didn't get changes in numbers, but that is the first step. And then meaningful engagement, meaning that I'm actually seeing an improvement in a specific clinical trial transparency practice. And maybe I'll just shout out that there are some meaningful changes that have happened. So um, for example, trials that have been registered in the EU clinical trial registry, and thanks in no small part to, to, to work that uh, Nick and, and, and with your supervisor you've done, um, that has jumped at the Charité from just over 50% in late 2020 to now over 96%. So, you know, to remember that, hey, we are getting better at some things, and that's already a success. <laughs> and Sally? So, I'm again, from a different perspective... Uh, for me, success is actually revising the uh, grant review process, uh, the grant award process, because review and reward are two distinct steps. And right now it is a very flawed process. So learning how, figuring out how to uh, fund researchers that addresses some of the very issues brought up here. Researchers need to be funded longer than three years at a time. They might need to be funded at 10 years at a time. Uh, with in, in interim steps, but figuring out what supports the current style of research. Our grant program was developed following World War II, more than a few years ago. So the idea that we need a uh, new process that meets the needs of today's researchers uh, is just uh, clearly something that we should be trying to achieve. And so for me, revising that process so that uh, researchers got the funding, had the time to report their results, had the time to uh, figure out their study design didn't work, revise their study design and move forward without jeopardizing their next grant. I think it would take care of a lot of the reproducibility issues if they had time to go back and fix themselves. So fixing that process, that's that would be a huge success for me. Okay, I'm going to hand it back over to Delwyn now to sort of wrap up some of what we're talking to, uh, incorporate some of the different strands that things were happening on throughout this. Are you ready to come back to us, Delwyn? All right. 
thanks a lot, uh, Nick. So, yeah, there's been a lot of frantic um, note taking in the background here. And actually, uh, so Frederic and I have been jotting notes down in a mural. Some of you are familiar with that. That's kind of a, um, a, a whiteboard so, uh, in, in a way. And so um, this is not comprehensive, but I think we're going to be daring and just give you a sneak peek. And the idea is that um, we're going to keep building that based on the notes that we took today and then hopefully be able to share that with you after the meeting so that you can also take away some of the lessons learned uh, that we um, found out about in the meeting. So I'll just share screen. So um, here we go. So hopefully you can see this. Um, and yeah, again, just uh, an attempt to consolidate some of the ideas discussed today. So first we talked about these first steps of how do you move from identifying a problem to proposing a solution. And, you know, we talked a lot about frustration with this, you know, we, and a flawed process, a lot of biases, um, assessment is not scientifically developed and so forth. And so there was really a call uh, from the panelists today to, to just act on that frustration. At the same time, there was also an acknowledgement of the importance of timing and luck um, that was not to be minimized as well. Um, there was also a lot of comments that related to um, the importance of also recognizing that, you know, some people are really in a supportive environment, have the financial resources as well as protected time to, to really work on, on solutions, whereas others may not always have the, the, the space and the bandwidth to do that. Um, and so maybe an option is also to choose environments that are, are ready and supportive for change. Um, but an important step that was identified was really at the very beginning, it's just key to raise awareness of the problem. That is a really important first step, and it's a really meaningful one um, that, that, that has a lot of value. Um, so then moving on to uh, the next theme of the discussion was revolving around stakeholders and three of the big stakeholders that were mentioned in the discussion today were journals and publishers, funders and research institutions. We talked about the importance of identifying these gatekeepers, so stakeholders such as these. And um, so, but there was also a, a call to find a few leaders in the community who are willing to take risks. So maybe it's not so much about you know, appealing to a broad audience, but sometimes it can just be more impactful to really identify two or three people who just have the, again, may have the environment or just like the, the really strong motivation to, to help you and also willing to take risks. There were also um, concerns about, you know, how existing structures can hold you back. Um, and, and so it's really important to promote initiatives beyond these existing structures. Uh, then we moved on into... Uh, some some ways in which stakeholders um, in which you can engage stakeholders. So we talked about some initiatives like these, this institutional dashboard that shows communicates with people how an institution is performing on certain practices, as well as um, phone calls and interviews and so forth. But really, here an important point was just the importance of giving people the tools and and tools that are not only created in isolations, but together with the community to make sure that they fit their needs. And so uh, tools were really seen as an important way of engaging with stakeholders. Of course, a lot of challenges were identified with engagement. So this, uh, this came up a lot, this difference between meaningful engagement and wanting to engage. Um, and, and that it's really important not only to you know, put some to reform policy, but also really actively monitor what how how that is being implemented and ensure that it really meets the needs of the community. So um yeah, I don't want to make this too long, but just uh maybe this section here, this was about what you appeal to when engaging to stakeholders, what has worked. And Chris really made the, the, the important points about, you know, the fact that if you appeal to evidence at the very start of the process, you can end up in this endless loop. Um, and, and that's sometimes not, not very productive. Um, and there's also this status quo bias. So, you know, what is the evidence that the status quo is working? And that's really an important step in this process. Um, and if you don't try it, you'll never know. We also discussed about uh, the importance of identifying allies who can work maybe on a different level than you can and, and maybe appeal at a different level, perhaps an emotional level. 
Um, and so that combination of, of appealing to different things, it, it can be quite su successful. Uh, again, we talked about tools as, as a way of appealing to people and then changing incentives, but that's frustratingly slow at times. And uh, Pivotal also was the role of funding institutions, but we also discuss that that can be quite challenging and sometimes um, the only solution is to, to make it hurt. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, just the last two points were how to overcome inertia in particular, this very known challenge of, you know, convincing, for example, your, your supervisor and, and, and this common problem of power imbalances and why supervisors can actually be a barrier. An additional challenge of, you know, as an ECR, you, you, you're struggling with this, this problem that you don't have much stability. So you're, you're kind of playing the game to survive. You might start a project but not be able to see it through. So how do you over, overcome some of these challenges? Well, um, and Chris said, I think some people never change, but you can maybe change the environment around them. And also, we discuss a lot the, the, the importance of being persistent, also across generations. Focus on those people that are open and willing to change. Find allies in the crowd. Um, but again, here, the you know that's all important. But again, these people also need the resources. So there's only so much they can do um, with the resources at their disposal. And that, again, speaks to the importance of having systemic change. And then finally, more positive outlook. Um, Although you see we were running uh, um, out of steam here a little bit, but essentially this was the section about what does success look like. We talked about um, it being easier to secure and sustain funding for implementation initiatives. Um, also talked about developing more tools for the community, seeing a real uptake in, in practices, for example, if that's what your, your initiative is about. Um, and then fundamentally also about revisions to the grant review process and figuring out how to fund researchers in such a way that addresses uh, ongoing issues in the system. So that's it from our side. Um, so we'll be sharing that also after the meeting when we've consolidated a bit more of your notes. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot, Dylan. Uh, that was really fantastic, actually. And um, yeah, like we said, we're happy to like sort of share. We'll use the same channels we went out to for the pre-survey, I think, um, maybe, if we're able to do that, which shouldn't be a problem. But um, yeah, we're just about at time here, and I want to just thank all of our panelists. And I want to um, say that I really hope that, A, that, um, that I know that there were people here from outside academia and people asking questions also from outside academia. And I hope that despite us all being academics uh, and speaking a lot about the academic perspective about some of the lessons and takeaways that might've been useful to folks working in other areas. And then um, and then I also just want to take away that I hope that this discussion can keep going. And uh, if you have thoughts or would like to chat about this, um, please, I would say, consider reaching out to uh, to me or or Delwin or, or the people who, you know, were hosted and um, maybe some of the panelists would, would be, uh, I know Chris was chatting with somebody and Gabe said he would be in touch in the Q&A section. So um, yeah, so thanks so much with uh, for your participation, for your time and for your interest. And once again, yeah, thank you to Sally and Kelly and Maya and, um, and to Chris in absentia for being here with us. Um, uh, if no one else has anything else, I think we will conclude it there. <laughs>